Hi there, my name is Perry, and welcome to the Literary Knitterary. Alright, so for today, day four of 12 Days of Classics, I read books seven and eight of The Odyssey. And I'm gonna be honest with you, uh, book seven and eight are not the most eventful sections of The Odyssey by any means. Basically, Odysseus follows Nausicaa's instruction and goes to Elsinous's palace. Athena helps him by shrouding him in mist and also appears to him in the form of a young woman and leads him there. We get a little bit of backstory about the Phaeacians, including the fact that they are master shipbuilders whose ships are directed by thought and can travel impossibly fast. And and also the fact that um, the king and queen, Nausicaa's parents, are related to each other. The king is the queen's uncle as well as her husband, which is a detail I definitely did not remember. There's a description of how beautiful and great the palace and the surrounding land is, but basically Odysseus goes in and supplicates before the queen and asks her for help, and the king is like, yeah, we'll help you. And the queen is like, hey, it looks like you're already wearing clothes that I made. Would you care to explain, like, how you got here? And he kind of explains how he got there, but only like the last 5% of the story where he's like been imprisoned on Calypso's island and then he finally is, you know, let go, released, and then he's on the raft and Poseidon basically ruins all of his plans. So like everything that just happened, we get a recap. And then he also explains that Nausicaa helped him and gave him clothing and they're like, oh great, you should stay over. And that's literally all that happens in book seven. And then in book eight, basically Elsa Noas is like, hey, we have a guest, so we should have a party and let's bring the poet Demodocus. And Demodocus starts singing a song about uh, the fight between Achilles and Odysseus and Odysseus starts crying because you know it reminds him of all of his troubles and then so Elsa Noas is like ah shit like my guest of honor is upset let's do something else let's play sports. So all the Phaeacian lads play sports and then one of Elsa Noas's sons is like hey stranger because they don't know his name yet do you like also want to play sports you seem like maybe you play sports and one of the other Phaeacian youths is like Psh, I bet he doesn't even know how to play sports I bet he's like a stupid merchant and so Odysseus gets mad and hurls a big heavy discus really far and it's like ha and Athena's like yeah ha and also knows is like ooh, this is super awkward my guests are fighting with each other maybe we should have like dancing and more singing instead and Demodocus sings a longer song which is the famous episode of Hephaestus catching Ares and Aphrodite uh, you know in in some naughty business um, by setting up a uh, net of golden chains to entrap them I feel like most people know that story and then there's like giving of gifts and then they're at a feast and Odysseus is like I know I have an idea um, so he sends over like a plate of meat to Demodocus the poet and is like hey Demodocus you're a really good singer you should sing a song about uh the wooden horse at troy and i'll tell you whether you did a good job or not and so he starts telling that story and odysseus starts crying again and also Noah is like jesus christ this is the worst party ever Demodocus stops singing and then he's like okay dude clearly you're going through some stuff I promise that we'll send you home on one of our super fancy magic ships that make Poseidon crazy but will you just like tell us who you are and what's going on with you so basically these two books are just a transition into Odysseus telling his own story which as I mentioned I think two videos ago is a pretty long story in these two books you have the appearance of several themes that we've already talked about obviously hospitality and how you treat a stranger and also a little bit of the whole like comparison of different types of communities and civilizations thing, but there's not really enough going on there to warrant another separate conversation just yet, I don't think. But there are a couple of language things I just want to talk about quickly. First of all, in book eight, when Elsa knows is like, hey, let's play sports, all of the young men of Phaeacia are introduced, and they all kind of have nautical, like, boat and ocean themed names because the Phaeacians are master shipbuilders, as we've mentioned before. But obviously, rendering puns in a translation can be really difficult. In the Fagel's translation, he just goes ahead and calls them what the roots of their names mean. So the passage reads like, top sail and riptide rose, the helmsman row hard too, and sea man and stern man, surf at the beach and stroke oar, breaker and bow spirit, racing the wind and swing aboard and sea girt the son of great fleet, shipwrightson and the son of launcher, broad sea rose up too. And I was taking notes when I first read this translation and evidently I thought that was kind of dumb. And I think it was just the inconsistency of the naming convention that felt really incongruous and strange to the point of silliness to me. Not even all of the Phaeacians had their names translated into the root words that their names were based on and so I understand that otherwise you kind of miss the puns, but that passage is just kind of silly to read. The Lombardo translation just uses the regular Greek names and as far as I can tell doesn't explain that there are 
double entendres going on, even in any sort of explanatory back matter, I can't find anything. So I think the Wilson strikes a happy medium by rendering the names as the original Greek names in the text, but having a footnote on the same page that explains what all of the names are supposed to sound like or represent, that explains the puns for you. So you can get the meaning without totally being taken out of the story and being like, wait, there's a man named Rohard now? So because there wasn't a whole lot going on in the two books today, I also started reading the introduction, which is also written by Emily Wilson herself. At least in this edition, I don't know about any supplementary material if you have the other edition. So I'm about 15 pages into it. I read the first sort of general introduction section and then the section entitled Who Was Homer? And she brought up a couple of really interesting points that I want to add into the conversation. Um, first of all, I've been throwing around the word epithet and talking about things like, you know, rosy fingered dawn or lion-hearted Achilles or whatever. Obviously Achilles hasn't come up because he's dead. But she explains what makes an epithet different from an adjective and why we use terminology to distinguish between them. Characters and objects all have their own descriptive terms in Homer. These are known as epithets rather than adjectives because they express an essential quality or characteristic rather than a trait that the object or person possesses only in a particular moment. Ships are black, hollow, swift, or curved, never brown, slow, or wobbly. Chairs are well-carved or polished, never uncomfortable or expensive. Penelope is prudent Penelope, never swift-footed Penelope, even if she is moving quickly. This is interesting because it calls to mind the idea of archetype in some ways. Like in modern descriptive writing, if you were writing about a chair, you would probably be encouraged to explain what makes it different from other chairs. You know, maybe it's, maybe it is uncomfortable or stiff-backed or scratched up or chewed on by a dog or something. Maybe it's dusty, maybe it's broken. But in the Odyssey, even these mundane objects or relatively mundane objects like chairs and ships are defined by their permanent qualities and also in some ways by their ability to represent the entire group of objects. They're almost metonymic. It's not this specific chair. It's like, here's the concept of a chair. And Wilson goes on to explain that this is because this is a holdover from oral modes of composition. We're having certain set pieces, certain set ways that you describe someone arming for battle or taking a bath or eating a meal. It makes it much easier to compose a poem at the speed of speech rather than, you know, the writer that you picture today who might be sitting over their typewriter, you know, torturing, laboring for hours <laughs> over a handful of adjectives, right? And before I move on from that, I wanted to mention one specific epithet, which was calling Odysseus the many-minded hero, which just struck me as something really, really interesting and beautiful, again, sorry, while I was reading. It's just really interesting to imply that Odysseus the trickster contains many minds within himself. You know, he's not just lying or pretending to put on different selves. In some sense, he actually contains each of the selves he pretends to be. And hopping back to the introduction, Wilson says, Odysseus himself seems to contain multitudes. He is a migrant, a pirate, a carpenter, a king, an athlete, a beggar, a husband, a lover, a father, a son, a fighter, a liar, a leader, and a thief. He is a man who cries, takes naps, and feels homesick, but he is also a man who has a special relationship with the goddess who transforms his appearance at will and ensures that his schemes succeed. I meant for that to all kind of be under the subheading of epithets, but I feel like I've meandered a little bit. But either way, we're going to hop on back to the Homeric question section before we finish up. Something I appreciated about this introduction, something new that it taught me, was that uh, Perry and Lord in the, you know, middle third of the 20th century, the 1930s to the 1960s, were not the first people to propose that the Homeric epics were in some way derived from an oral culture. Apparently as early as the 1600s people were pointing out the sort of inconsistencies or the repetitiveness of the Odyssey and saying that it was therefore obviously derived from some sort of folk tradition. I think the main difference is that those people were mostly saying it in a really negative way, that it's being descended in some way or influenced in some way by oral poetry, made it somehow primitive or shoddily composed. The argument being this is bad and it's like this other thing that I don't think is good. So Perry and Lord were not the first people to have those ideas, which I feel like other introductions that I've read kind of made it seem like they were, but they were the first people to prove it basically by comparing the formulaic pieces of the Iliad and the Odyssey to the way that oral poets bards were working in European cultures at the time. Obviously there is not one set scholarly consensus about the way that the Odyssey and the Iliad came into being from beginning to end and there never will be. But I think the most compelling and interesting argument that Wilson makes on the subject is that just because the Odyssey has in some ways a coherent structure 
is a unified whole, we don't have to assume that that means it was at some point, at any point, the work of one single person. That just because we can find consistency from the beginning to the end doesn't mean that one guy sat down and wrote it out one day. I don't know if you would even have time to write down 12,000 lines of anything in a day. She challenges us to expand our ideas of the way narratives are made, and interestingly, she draws a parallel to the way movies and television shows are made to try to make that point. And I'm just a huge fan of multi-vocal works of things that challenge or disrupt our ideas of authorship and that's one of my favorite things about the odyssey is that the language it is written in is an amalgamation of words from different time periods from different places that no one person has ever spoken the language that the odyssey is written down in that it is sort of this conglomeration of a thing um, that seemingly has been touched by many hands, to me that makes it more important, more interesting, more precious than if a single genius had sat down and written all of this out from memory. To me that is the much more compelling and exciting possibility, but I would be interested to know what you think. Finally, I'm just going to fangirl over Emily Wilson again really quickly and say that this is a really good introduction. And without being overt or preachy about it, I think does a really good job of answering the question of like why classics are relevant to us today. In particular, there were a few lines from this introduction that just really, really hit me hard at the closing of the year of our Lord 2020. She basically begins the introduction by talking about how in some ways the Odyssey is a startlingly mundane story for what we currently think of as an epic. Um, it begins in the middle of things when everything has kind of been at a standstill, has been paused or, or stalled for seven years, you know, things on Ithaca are going the way things on Ithaca are going and Odysseus has been trapped with Calypso for years. Everybody's in stasis when the story begins, or rather when the poem begins, because the poem doesn't begin with the beginning of the story. And sure, there's giants and sea monsters and witches but also it's fundamentally a story about a guy who wants to go home. I'm gonna get the syntax wrong here, but this is a, a nostos, a story of home going, of homecoming. And that's the same word that the word nostalgia comes from, right? Which is the sort of yearning for the past. So she says, in the Odyssey, we find instead, instead of a great quest to save the world, the story of a man whose grand adventure is simply to go back to his own home, where he tries to turn everything back to the way it was before he went away. For this hero, mere survival is the most amazing feat of all. So that hits pretty hard this year. <laughs> and then a bit later, the poem promotes but also questions its own fantasies and ideals, such as the idea that time and change can be undone, and the notion that there is such a thing as home where people and relationships can stay forever the same. I'm probably going to talk about this in an upcoming video, but uh, in college I wrote about sort of impermanence or instability in the Odyssey, specifically in relation to the idea of identity and in relation to the fact that regardless of how the poem was composed and recorded, the cultures depicted are mostly pre-literate or illiterate. But these sections of the introduction have me thinking about impermanence and change on a grander scale in the poem. In some ways, I've been thinking that the sort of non-linear structure of the storytelling where we pause and characters tell their own stories, which makes the timeline do all kinds of crazy things, makes it feel like everything exists at the same time. There are references to things early in the poem that you don't hear about happening until late in the poem. And part of that is because the people who would have been hearing or reading this poem would already have been pretty familiar with the mythology, the tradition on which it's based, right? That's also discussed in the Homeric question section. But time doesn't really work like that, and the people in the poem know that too. Even when Odysseus does get home, he's not home forever. He doesn't get to stay. Basically to settle his beef with Poseidon he's going to have to take an oar and walk inland until he meets people who have no idea what an oar is and then he's going to plant the oar in the ground and then he's going to die. It's not really specified how long he has before he has to do this but even when he finally makes it home he's not home for good. Even once he gets home and sets his affairs in order his son who was an infant when he left is a fully grown man, his dad is old, his friggin dog dies in front of him like. So as I said I've already thought a, a fair bit about ideas of impermanence in the Odyssey but I think this time I'm also going to focus a little bit more on 
the idea of home and of homecoming, what it means to be home, whether it is a home, if it is conditional or not permanent, or if, as these lines suggest, a home is a thing where people and relationships can stay forever the same, a home is inherently nostalgic and backwards looking, casting back for a sense of safety and belonging that no longer exists once you are out in the outside world and can never completely be regained. If, as these lines suggest, going home is an impossibility as great as traveling back in time. Well, that went a direction I did not anticipate. Let me know if you have any thoughts about boat names or sports in the ancient world or the Homeric question or all of that rambling that I just did about permanence and home going. Or if that sounds complicated and you just want to let me know that you were here, you can leave me an emoji in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, I do hope you'll consider subscribing and I will see you again soon. But in the meantime, I hope everyone is staying happy, healthy, and safe. And I hope that somewhere out there, there's a great book waiting just for you. Bye.